are beginning chapter 18, pushing children into suicide with happy pills. Of deadly medicines and organized crime, how Big Pharma has corrupted healthcare, Peter, by Peter C. Goitze. Glaxo Study 329. In 2001, GlaxoSmithKline published a trial in children and adolescents study 329. This study reported that Paxil Serozat was effective with minimal side effects, and it was widely believed and cited no less than 184 times by 2010, which is remarkable. However, the trial was fraudulent. We know this because the Attorney General of New York State sued the company in 2004 for repeated and persistent consumer fraud in relation to concealing harms of Paxil, which opened the company's archives as part of a settlement. Glaxo lied to its sales force, telling them that trial 329 showed remarkable efficacy and safety while the company admitted in internal documents that the study didn't show Paxil was effective. The study was negative for efficacy on all eight protocol-specific outcomes and positive for harm. These indisputable facts were washed away with extensive data ma manipulations, so that he published... Wait a minute. So that the published paper which, although it was ghostwritten, had 22 authors, ended up reporting positive effects. The data message produced four statistically significant effects after splitting the data in various ways, and it was clear that many variations were tried before the data confessed. The paper didn't leave any trace of the torture. In fact, it falsely stated that the new outcomes were declared priori. I guess priority. For harms, the manipulations were even worse. The internal unpublished study report that became available through litigation showed that at least eight children became suicidal on Paxil versus one on placebo. This was a serious and statistically significant harm of Paxil. There were 11 serious adverse effects in total among 93 children treated with Paxil and among two and two among 87 children treated with placebo, which was significant. My calculation, the paper didn't say that this difference was statistically significant. Uh, oh, oh, I fucked up. P equals 0 0.01, my calculation, the paper didn't say this, that this difference was statistically significant. This means that for every town children treated with Paxil instead of placebo, there was one more serious adverse event. The inverse of the risk difference, 11 by 93. Ah, fuck these numbers. However, the abstract of the paper is ended thus. Conclusions. Paroxetine is generally well tolerated and effective for major depression in adolescents. An early draft of the paper prepared for JAMA didn't discuss serious adverse effects at all. JAMA rejected the paper and later drafts mentioned that worsening depression, emotional liability, headaches, and hostility were considered related or possibly related to treatment. The published paper didn't mention the serious adverse effects, but only headache in one patient was considered by the treating investigator to be related to paroxetine treatment. I have my doubts about whether the drug investigators really made these decisions as the adverse events were reported to the company and appeared in earlier drafts. It's more likely that it was people employed by Glaxo that interpreted the drug's harm so generously. In the published paper, Five cases of suicidal thoughts and behavior were listed as emotional liability and three additional cases of suicidal ideation or self-harm were called hospitalization. At least three adolescents treated or attempted suicide, but this wasn't described in the paper. 
Its first author, Martin Keller, wrote that they were terminated from the study because of non-compliance. There were other issues the published, the published paper said nothing about. For one of the suicidal teenagers, the treating psychiatrist asked a researcher involved with the study to break the blind, which he refused, although the protocol provided for this. Another non-compliant teenager ingested 82 tablets of paracetamol, which is a deadly dose. Most curiously, another teenager was enrolled with the same trial number as the suicidal one. Although this should be impossible, but perhaps the new patient took what remained of the study drug? This raises the uncomfortable question whether some patients who had fared badly were excluded from the trial. When the FDA demanded the company to review the, the data again, there were four additional cases of intentional self-injury, suicidal ideation or self suicidal attempt, all on paroxetine. Keller is some character. He double billed his travel expenses, which were reimbursed both by his university and the drug sponsor. Further, the Massachusetts Department of Mental Health had paid for Brown's psychiatry department, which Keller chaired hundreds of thousands of dollars to fund research that wasn't being conducted. Keller himself received hundreds of thousands of dollars from drug companies every year that he didn't disclose. A social worker found a computer disk in the hallway and opened it to see whom she sh should return it to. She realized that adolescents were listed as if they had been enrolled in a study, which wasn't true. It seemed that they were made up, which would have been tempting given that $25,000 was offered by the drug company for each vulnerable teenager. The president of a chapter of the National Alliance for the Mentally Ill, supposed to be a patient advocacy group, but, for, but heavily supported by Big Pharma, lectured for patients and their relatives on drug company money, which he didn't reveal, and the honoraria were whitewashed. Keller never admitted there was anything wrong with the way he reported Study 329 and his misdeeds didn't harm his career. His department had received $50 million in research funding, and a spokesperson from Brown said that Brown takes seriously the integrity of its scientific research. Dr. Keller's research regarding Paxo complied with Brown's research standards. Well, thanks for letting us know that. With such ethical standards, we should never apply for a job at Brown's. The role of the journal, Journal of the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry, was similarly depressing. Although the journal's editors were shown evidence that the article misrepresented the science, they refused to convey this information to the medical community and to retract the article, thereby jeopardizing their scientific standing and moral responsibility to prescribers and patients. An explanation for this passivity can be likely found by following the money that goes to the journal's owner. What caused the greatest public uproar was that Glaxo pushed its drug for use in children. Although it not only didn't work in children, it was also very harmful, and it wasn't even approved for use in children. The illegal marketing involved withholding trials showing Paxil was ineffective. An internal company document showed that the company knew what it was doing. It, it would be commercially unacceptable to include a statement that efficacy had not been demonstrated, as this would undermine the profile of paroxetine. The ruthless marketing worked. From 1998 to 2001, 5 million prescriptions a year were being written for Paxil and Zoloft for children and adolescents. We should remember that there are real tragedies behind the numbers and real people who have paid with their lives for the companies, unscrupulous lies, frauds and crimes. Frauds and crimes, I thought that was a question mark. Matt Miller was unhappy, having moved to a new neighborhood and a new school, 
Matt was thrust into unknown territory without his support system of old friends with whom he had grown up. That summer, Matt was prescribed Zoloft and was told to call his doctor in a week. On a Sunday night, after taking his 17th pill, Matt went to his bedroom closet where there was a hook just a little higher than he was tall. Matt hung himself. Having to lift his legs off the floor and hold himself there until he passed out, he was only 17 years old. Jeremy Lone, a teenager, suffered from Tourette syndrome. To treat his uncontrollable tics and verbal outbursts, his neurologist prescribed Prozac. Three weeks after starting the medication, Jeremy hanged himself in the woods behind his house. Candace, a 12-year-old girl, was prescribed Zoloft because she suffered from anxiety. She was a happy child and never been depressed or had suicidal ideation. She hanged herself after four days. Vicki Hartman was given a sample pack of Zoloft by her child's doctor. She didn't suffer from any mental disorder, but mentioned she needed a pick-me-up to help with stress. Soon after starting the medication, she shot her husband and herself. A man hanged himself after taking Prozac, which his cardiologist had prescribed for chest pain, and a woman shot herself after taking Prozac her family doctor had prescribed for migraine. 20-year-old student Justin Chelsek had trouble sleeping and was prescribed sleeping pills by his doctor. A few days later, he complained to the doctor that the pills made him feel groggy and depressed. The doctor gave him Paxil, and Justin told his mother that Paxil made him feel awful, wound up jumpy and unable to sit or concentrate. Two weeks later, the doctor gave him another SSRI, Effexor, then Lefexine, which caused a seizure after the first tablet. Justin f still felt really bad and three weeks after he Turk took his first Paxil tablet, he hanged himself. Justin had no history of depression, and if he hadn't used the term depressed, he might not have been prescribed SSRIs. Abracadabra, careful with your speak, people. He had just trouble, he had just trouble sleeping. In the days before his death, Justin described a feeling of wanting to jump out of his skin, a symptom typical of acesthesia, which may lead to suicide. In November 2010, Nancy and Sean McCartney's 18-year-old son, Brennan, went to their family doctor with a chest cold. The extroverted high school student mentioned feeling sad over breaking up with a girl he'd been seeing for three months. He left with a script for an antibiotic and a sample pack of Seraplex. Nancy expressed concern, and Brennan had no history of depression, but he assured her, but he assured her the doctor had said it would help. On the 14th day, Brennan seemed agitated when he left the house and he failed to come home. The next day, his body was found. He had hung himself in a local park. Nancy wanted to warn other Canadians about Siraflex and submitted an adverse reaction report. And when she noticed a typo on her entry, she called the Vigilance branch requesting a correction. She also asked for an updated copy, but was told she'd have to file an access to information request. Seven months later, anyone searching Seraplex on MedEffect would find 317 reports, including five suicides, 12 suicide attempts, and many references to suicidal ideation, but not Nancy's submission. When the journalist writing about the tragedy asked Health Canada why its spokesperson responded weeks later saying, the entry was in the database and provided a screen grab. However, subsequent searches using the same terms failed to find it. It's unbelievable. Not even suicides reported to the authorities may be traceable in their records. 
Here is an example that the advertising of prescription drugs to the public, which is legal in the United States, can kill healthy people who don't need them. Ten years ago, my irrepressible teenage daughter, Caitlin, returned from holiday with relatives in the U.S., where prescription drugs are widely advertised. She saw an ad for an antidepressant called Prozac and wanted to try it. She went to our local GP and it took her eight minutes to get the prescription. 63 days later, during which time she descended into unprecedented chaos, including neural twitches, violent nightmares, and self-harm, she hanged herself. Concealing suicides and suicide attempts in clinical trials. I shall explore here what the true risk of suicide and suicidality with SSRIs are. They are certainly much larger than what the drug companies have told us. David Healy performed a study in 20 healthy volunteers, all with no history of depression or other mental illness. And to his big surprise, two of them became suicidal when they received Cetraline or Zoloft. One of them was on her way out the door to kill herself in front of a train or a car when a phone call saved her. Both volunteers remained disturbed for several months later and seriously questioned the stability of their personalities. Pfizer's own studies in healthy volunteers had shown similar deleterious effects, but most of these data are hidden in company files. FDA reviewers and independent researchers found that the big companies had concealed cases of suicidal <laughs> thoughts and acts by labeling them emotional liability. However, the FDA bosses suppressed this information. When safety officer Andrew Morsholder concluded that SSRIs caused increased suicidality among teenagers, the FDA prevented him from presenting his findings at an advisory meeting and suppressed his report. When the report was leaked, the FDA's reaction was to do a criminal investigation into the leak. There were other problems. In data submitted by GlaxoSmithKline to the FDA in the late 1980s and early 1990s, the company had included suicide attempts from the washout period before the patients were randomized in results for the placebo arms of trials, but not for the, the paroxetine arms. A Harvard psychiatrist, Joseph Glenmullen, who studied the released papers for the lawyers, said that it's virtually impossible that Glaxo simply misunderstood the data. Martin Brecker, the FDA scientist who, received, who reviewed paroxetine safety, said, that this use of the washout data was scientifically legitimate. Indeed, I believe it's fraud. David Healy wrote in 2002 that, based on data he had obtained from the FDA, three of five suicide attempts on placebo in a cetraline trial had occurred during washout rather than while on placebo, <clears throat> and that two suicides and three of six attempts on placebo and a paroxetine trial had also occurred in the washout period. Healy's observations weren't denied by Pfizer and Glaxo, but Glaxo again provided a glaring example that their lives are not of this world. The drug versus true placebo analysis Dr. Healy describes is not only scientifically invalid, but also misleading. Major depressive disorder is a potentially very serious illness associated with substantial morbidity, mortality, suicidal ideation, suicidal attempts, and completed suicide. Unwarranted conclusions about the use and risk of antidepressants, including paroxetine, do a disservice to patients and physicians. So, should we trust people who deliberately hide suicidal harms of their drug and hide trials that showed no effect and make billions out of their frauds, who are only responsible to their shareholders, and who nonetheless want us to believe that patient welfare is their primary concern? 
Or should we trust an academic like Healy whose job it is to take care of the patients? At least three companies, Glaxo, Lilly, and Pfizer, added cases of suicide and suicide attempts in patients to the placebo arm of their trials. <clears throat> Although they didn't occur while the patients were randomized to placebo, the omissions can be important for their companies in court cases. For example, a man on paroxetine had murdered his wife, daughter, and granddaughter and had committed suicide. But in its defense, Glaxo said that its trials didn't show an increased risk of suicide on paroxetine. The pervasive scientific misconduct had distorted seriously our perception of the benefits and harms of SSRIs. An example, a 2004 systematic review showed that when unpublished trials were included, a favorable risk-benefit profile changed to an unfavorable one for several of the SSRIs. Also in 2004, a researcher used the full report of Glaxo's trial that were made available on the internet as a result of litigation, and he found in his meta-analysis that paroxetine increased significantly suicidal tendencies, odds ratio 2.77, 95% confidence interval, I don't know that shit. He included three trials, among them the unpublished study 377, which didn't show that paroxetine was better than placebo. Glaxo had stated in an internal document that there are no plans to publish data from study 377. He also included the infamous study 329. He described that an 11-year-old boy who threatened to harm himself and was hospitalized was code as a case of exacerbated depression and that a 14 year old boy who had harmed himself and expressed hopelessness and possible suicide thoughts and was hospitalized was coded as a case of aggression. It is widely believed that SSRIs only increase suicidal behavior in people below 25 years of age, but this is not correct. In 2006, FDA analysis of 372 placebo-controlled trials of SSRI and similar drugs involving 100,000 patients found that up to about 40 years of age, the drugs increased suicidal behavior, and in older patients, they decreased. However, as explained below, it is much worse than this. A major weakness of the FDA study is that events and wait, wait a minute. A major weakness of the FDA study is that the agency asked the companies to adjudicate possibly suicide-related adverse events and send them to the FDA, which didn't verify whether they were correct or whether some had been left out. We already know that the companies have cheated shamelessly when publishing suicidal events. Why should they not continue cheating when they know that the FDA doesn't check what they are doing? Furthermore, collection of adverse effects wasn't limited to within one day of stopping randomized treatment. Although stopping an SSRI increases the risk of suicidality for several days or weeks, this rule, therefore, also seriously underestimated the harms of SSRIs. Other data show that the huge FDA analysis cannot be reliable. An internal Lilly memo from 1984 reported that the German drug agency described two suicides and 16 suicide attempts among only 1,427 patients on the fluoxetine on fluoxetine in clinical trials, even though patients at risk of suicide were excluded from the trials. A memo from Lilly, Germany listed nine suicides in 6,993 patients on fluoxetine in the trials. In contrast, there were only five studies in total in FDA's analysis of 52,960 patients on SSRI drugs or one per 10,000 patients, although one would have expected 74 and 68 respectively, 
based on two Lilly reports or 13 per 10,000 patients. Many suicides are missing in the FDA analysis. In a 1995 meta-analysis, there were five suicides on paroxetine in, in 2,963 patients, which is 17 per 10,000 patients. This meta-analysis wrongly reported two suicides on placebo, which had occurred in the washout period. The UK drug regulator was much more careful than the FDA and did not only search for suicide terms in the documents, but also read text in case report forms and narratives. They showed that paroxetine was harmful in adults with major depressive disorder. There were 11 suicide attempts on paroxetine, 3,455 patients, and only one on placebo, 1,978 patients. P equals 0 0.058 for the difference. I wonder why no suicides were reported as we would have expected six on paroxetine. A 2005 meta-analysis that built on data in a report the UK drug regulator had made found nine suicides in 23,804 patients or four per 10,000. This was an unusually low rate and it had been shown that the companies underreported the suicide risk. There were other oddities the researchers found that non-fatal self-harm and suicidality were seriously underreported compared to the reported suicides. A 2005 meta-analysis of published trials including 87,650 patients conducted by independent researchers included all ages found double as many suicide attempts on drug than on placebo. Even so, they found that many suicide attempts must have been missing. For example, by asking investigators, some of whom responded that there were suicide attempts they had not reported, while others replied that they didn't even look for them in, the trial, in their trials. There were other issues related to the trial design and likely led to underestimation of suicide attempts. For example, events occurring shortly after active treatment is stopped might very well be caused by the drug, but were not counted. It is abundantly clear that suicides, suicidality, and violence caused by SSRIs are grossly underestimated. And we also know the reasons. First, there is outright fraud. Second, many suicidal events have been coded as something else. Third, the drug industry has taken great care to bias its trials by only recruiting people at a very low risk of committing suicide. Four, the companies have urged the investigators to use benzodiazepines in addition to their drug and to their trial drugs which blunt some of the violent reactions that would otherwise have occurred. Fifth, some trials have run in, have run in periods on active drug and patients who don't tolerate it aren't randomized, which comes close to scientific, scientific misconduct, as it artificially minimizes the occurrence of suicidality. Six, and perhaps the worst of all, the biases, events occurring shortly after active treatment is stopped. For example, because the patients feel very badly, might very well be suicidal events caused by the drug, but are often not registered. Seventh, many of the trials are buried in the company archives, and these are not the most positive ones. Given what I have just described above and earlier, for example, the middle-aged woman who used duloxetine for urinary incontinence have a suicide attempt rate that is more than double the rate among other women of similar age. My take on all this, SSRIs likely increase the risk of suicide at all ages. These drugs are immensely harmful. Lundbeck's evergreening of cytolopram. Lundbeck launched Cytolopram, Cypramil, or Celex, in 1989, 
It became one of the most widely used SSRIs and provided the company with most of its income. That was a risky situation to be in, but Lundbeck was lucky. Cytoloperam is a stereoisomer and consists of two halves, which are mirror images of each other, but only one of them is active. Lundbeck patented the active half before the old patent ran out and called the rejuvenated me again drug Escitalopram, Ciprolex, or Lexapro, which it launched in 2002. When the patent for Escitalopram expired, generics for Cipramil entered the market at much lower prices, but the price of Ciprolex, Ciprolex continued to be very high. When I checked the Danish prices in 2009, Ciprolex costs 19 times as much for a daily dose as Cipramil. This enormous price difference should have deterred the doctors from using Ciprolex, but it didn't. The sales of Ciprolex were six times higher in monetary terms than the sales of Cytoloperam, both at hospitals and in primary care. I calculated that if all patients had received the cheapest Cytoloperam instead of Ciprolex or other SSRIs, Danish taxpayers could have saved around 30 million euros a year, or 87% of the total amount spent on SSRIs. How is it possible for doctors to have such a blatant disregard for the public per... per, per wait, how is it possible for doctors to have such a blatant disregard for the public purse to which we all contribute and why can it continue year after year the old recipe with a blend of money and hype research seems infallible the psychiatrist described vividly that when lundbeck launched ciprolex in 2002 most of the danish psychiatrist she did say most although there are more than a thousand psychiatrists in denmark were invited to a meeting in Paris. That meeting seems to have been enjoyable, with expensive lectures, of course, from Lundbeck's own stable, luxurious hotel and gourmet food, a so-called horror trip, under influence? No, of course not. A doctor doesn't get influenced, right? When the patient, when the patent of Cipramil was expiring, Jack M. Gorman published an article in a special supplement of CNS Spectrum's a neuropsychiatric journal, he edits. The article concluded that escitaloperam may have a faster onset of action and greater overall effect than cytoloperam. Gorman was a paid consultant to Forrest that marketed both drugs in North America and Foster paid Medworks Media, the publisher of CNS Spectrums, to print the article. At the same time, medical letter and independent drug bulletin with no advertising also reviewed the two drugs and found no difference between them on the occasion where i was invited to give a lecture for danish psychiatrists i expressed my doubts that a drug could be better than itself to a person sitting close to me at the, the lunch table she was a chemist working at the she was a chemist working at lundbeck and didn't agree. She sent me a copy of Gorman's paper, which on page two says, brought to you by an unrestricted, unrestricted educational grant from Forest Pharmaceuticals Incorporated. Oh no, I thought, I would never accept an unrestricted educational grant from a drug company, not even in the form of a reprint, but here it was. All three authors worked for Forrest, Gorman as a consultant and the others in the company. The paper was a meta-analysis of three trials that compared the two drugs with placebo. What am I supposed to make out of a paper published in a bot supplement to a journal edited by a person who is also bought by the company? Nothing, I would say. We cannot trust the drug industry, and a paper published this way is nothing but an advertisement. There are so many ways a trial can be manipulated and in SSRI trials, it's particularly crucial how the statistician deals with dropped out patients and other missing values. On the top of this, Lundbeck was in a pretty desperate situation. 
I therefore wouldn't believe anything unless I got access to the raw data and analyzed them myself. B. But it isn't necessary to go to such lengths. When Forrest published, what Forrest published was small differences between the two drugs and between active drugs and placebo. After eight weeks, the difference between the two drugs was one on a scale that goes from zero to 60, and the difference between the active drugs and placebo was three. Obviously, a difference of one on a 60-point scale has no importance for the patients. Furthermore, as explained in Chapter 4, it doesn't take much unblinding before we find a difference of three between active drugs and placebo, even if the drugs have no effect on depression. There is therefore no good reason to use a drug that is 19 times more expensive than itself. The official task of the government-funded Danish Institute for Rational Drug Therapy is to inform Danish doctors about drugs in an evidence-based fashion. In 2002, the Institute reviewed the clinical documentation for Lundbeck's me-again drug, escitalopram, and informed Danish doctors that it didn't have clear advantages over the old drug, which contained the same active substance. Lundbeck complained loudly about this in the press and said it was beyond the Institute's competence to give statements that could affect the international competition and damage Danish drug exports. Although it wasn't beyond the Institute's competence to give recommendations about new drugs, whatever the consequences for drug exports, the Institute was reprimanded by the Minister of Health, and it declined to comment when asked by a journalist for pretty obvious reasons. The Danish drug industry has tried for years to get political backing for closing down the Institute, which is a thorn in its flesh, as it reduces sales of expensive drugs, but it hasn't succeeded. It seems that our highly praised governmental institute is only allowed to tell the truth about important drugs, not about drugs we export. An untenable position that shows that principles are only valid as long as they don't cost too much. Two years after these events, the institute announced that escitalopram was better than citalopram and might be tried if the effect of citalopram hadn't been satisfactory. The Institute must have stepped on its toes to find a politically correct way to express themselves. The information to doctors now stated that they should usually choose the cheapest SSRI and there are no major differences between the drugs. About escitalopram, it said that two studies have shown that the effect of escitalopram comes somewhat faster than that of venlafaxine and cytoloparam, but with about the same maximum effects. And in a single study, it was made likely in a subgroup analysis that s is a little better in severe depression than venlafaxine and cytoloparam. I had a big laugh when I saw the four references in support of these statements. Paper is grateful, as we say, it doesn't protest, no matter what you write on it. On, well, no, one of the academic authors was Stuart Montgomery, who concealed that he worked for Pfizer, helping the company to get citrulline approved at the same time as he worked for the UK drug regulator that approved the drug. I laughed again when an employee from the Institute was interviewed in the TV news. She was pressured by the journalists who asked her if she couldn't imagine any situation where it might be an advantage that the drug worked faster. Yes, she said, if a patient was about to throw herself out the window. She learned the hard way how to deal with journalists. Jokes won't do on the news, particularly not if they are about patients. It was doubly ironic as it has never been demonstrated that SSRIs decrease the risk of suicide they seem to increase the risk. 
for independent reviewers of, of the evidence by the FDA, the American Advisory Group, Micromed Micromedics, the Stockholm Medical Council, and Danish Institute, concluded that escitalopram offers no significant benefit over its predecessor. The Cochrane Review on escitalopram said that it's better than citalopram, but warns against this finding because of potential sponsorship bias. The trials were performed by Lundbeck, and many negative antidepressant trials never get published. Furthermore, the reporting of the outcomes in the included studies was often unclear or incomplete. Analyses made by disinterested parties who have access to the data, such as scientists working at drug agencies, have reportedly found that there are no important differences in benefits and harms of the various SSRIs, whereas what gets published is seriously misleading. Comprehensive reviews by other researchers have also failed to find important differences. In 2003, Lundbeck breached the UK industry code of practice in, an ad in, in its advertising. The company breached the code on five counts, notably by claiming that Ciprolex is significantly more effective than Cipril in treating depression. The company also attributed adverse effects to Cytolopram in its literature on Escitalopram that weren't mentioned in promotional material for Cytolopram. This confirms the adage that it's suppressing how quickly a good drug becomes a bad drug when a more expensive drug comes around. The UK advertising campaign was intensive and highly successful, and as Escitalopram rapidly gained market share. Lundbeck CEO Eric Sprunk Jansen retired in 2003 and started a company selling herbal medicine. One of the products is Masculine, which spices up your love life and is said to give extra energy that strengthens the lust and blood circulation. Typical mumbo jumbo pep talk for alternative medicine. It doesn't seem to matter what the drug pushers sell as long as they sell something. In 2011, we asked Lundbeck for unpublished trials of its antidepressant drugs, which we needed for our research on suicidality. But we were told that the company, as a matter of principle, doesn't hand out the clinical documentation that forms the basis for marketing authorization. The same year, Lundbeck's new CEO, Ulf Weinberg, denied an interview that the increase in suicidal events with happy pills in children and adolescents means that the drugs increase the risk of suicide. He even stated that treatment of depression in children and adolescents decreases the suicide risk in violation of labeling that warns that the drugs may increase the risk of suicide. Why does any doctor trust what the companies tell them? Events in America were also interesting. In 2001, Lundbeck's American partner Forrest had performed a trial on Cytolopram, Celex, for compulsive shopping disorder. I'm not joking. And Good Morning America told the viewers that this new disorder could affect as many as 20 million Americans, of which 90% were women. Gorman appeared as an expert in the program and said that 80% of the compulsive shoppers had slowed their purchases on Celex. The ensuing flurry of publicity forced the APA to say it had no intention of adding such disorder to the DSM. In 2010, the U.S. Justice Department announced that Forrest had pleaded guilty to charges relating to obstruct and ob obstruction of justice and the illegal promotion of Cytolopram, Celex, and s -Cytolopram, Lexapro, for use in treating children and adolescents with depression. Forrest agreed to pay more than $313 million to resolve criminal and civil liability arising from these matters, and also faced numerous court cases from parents to children who had either committed suicide or had tried. There were also other charges that the company launched, seeding studies, which were marketing efforts to promote the drug's use. 
Two whistleblowers would receive approximately $14 million and Forrest signed a corporate integrity agreement. Six years earlier, a Forrest executive had testified before Congress that Forrest followed a law and had not promoted Celex and Lexapro to children, although Forrest had illegally done exactly that. The government mentioned that Forrest publicized and circulated the positive results of a double-blind placebo-controlled Forrest study in 2004 on the use of Celex in adolescents while at the same time failed to discuss the negative results of a contemporaneous double-blinded placebo-controlled Lundbeck study on the use of Celex in adolescents finished in 2002 in Europe but only mentioned in a textbook in Danish in 2003 in a single line of chart. For three years, Forrest executives didn't disclose those results within the company or to the outside researchers who published results on Celex. And the existence of the Lundbeck study first came to public light when the New York Times published an article about it. Only then did Forrest acknowledge the study, as well as another earlier trial that also failed to show any benefits of Lexapro as a depression treatment for children. Jesus Christ, there's so many fucking flies. Forrest's official excuse for not mentioning the negative trials was that there was no citable public reference for the authors to examine. But drug makers often announce trials with positive results without waiting for the results to be published. For example, Forrest issued a news release that highlighted the outcome of the positive Celex trial already in 2001, shortly after the trial's completion. Forrest had 19,000 advisory board members and used illegal kickbacks to include physicians and others to prescribe Celex and Lexapro, which is allegedly included cash payments disguised as grants for consulting fees, expensive meals, and lavish entertainment. On one occasion, Forrest paid physicians $500 to dine at one of the most expensive restaurants in Manhattan and called them consultants for evening, it seemed, and for the evening, it seemed, and they didn't do any consulting. Vermont officials found that Forrest's payments to doctors in 2008 were surpassed only by those of Eli Lilly, Pfizer, Novartis, and Merck. Companies with annual sales that were five to ten times higher, five to ten times larger than Forrest's. What was Lundbeck's reaction to the crimes? We know Forrest is a decent and ethically responsible firm, and we are therefore certain that this is an isolated error. Perhaps this confidence in Forrest's business ethics was related to the fact that Lexapro sold for $2.3 billion in 2008. At any rate, we do know something about what it means to be a decent and ethically responsible firm. In 2009, the U.S. Senate released documents it had requested from Forrest. They started out by saying that Forrest will communicate that Lexapro offers superior efficacy and tolerability over all SSRIs, which is pure fantasy. We are also told that the antidepressant market is the most heavily detailed category in the drug industry and that the sales mirror the promotional effort. Forrest will develop ghostwritten articles for thought leaders, which will allow us for to which will allow us to fold Lexapro messages and will also use thought leaders at sponsored symposia, which will be published in supplements to medical journals to help disseminate relevant Lexapro data and messages to key targeted audiences. The thought leaders, advisors, and Lexapro investigators will be kept informed by monthly mailings, and Forrest will use the consultant services of thought leaders and advisors to obtain critical feedback and recommendations on educational and promotional strategies and tacts. Forrest recruited about 2,000 psychiatrists and primary care physicians whom the company trained to serve as faculty for the Lexapro Speakers Bureau program. 
it was obligatory that speakers use this slide kit prepared by Forrest. The documents included details of a huge program of phase four studies, seating trials it seems, and it and described that investigator grants would cover the costs of thought leaders initiated in phase four studies with Lexapro. The outcome of all these studies seemed to have been determined beforehand, even before the studies started, as key messages were listed for each study. Bullet point one, escitalopram has the lowest potential for drug interactions. Bullet point two, escitalopram has an excellent dosing profile. Bullet point three, escitalopram represents a new, more selective, and or potent generation of SSRIs. Number four, escitalopram is an effective first line treatment for depression. Five, escitalopram has a favorable side effect profile. Six, escitalopram has improved side effect drug interaction and safety profiles resulting from the removal of the inactive moiety, moiety? or the R Antomer. Escitalopram is a refinement of citalopram in terms of antidepressant effect and tolerability. Forrest provided unrestricted grants to professional societies, for example, the American Psychiatric Association, so that they could develop reasonable practice guidelines. What was meant by this was to improve the percent of patients who adhere to full duration of therapy. Forrest became a corporate sponsor for the American College of Psych Physicians, which provides additional marketing opportunities, and this organization was also involved with developing the reasonable practice guidelines. I could throw up. Total corruption of academic medicine resulting in immense harms to patients who cannot get off the drug once they have adhered to full duration of therapy. So this is a decent and ethically responsible firm, right? I wonder what page I got. Fuck. We're calling it. Pick this up later. There's too many fucking flies out here.